Hey, Rachel, someone's at the door. Rachel! R Rachel, someone's at the door! I'll get it. Oh, it's, Har it's Harvester! <laughs> hey, welcome home, Harvester. I'll come out to you. There's too many of you to come inside. Hey, man, I I'm so excited about the Christmas season. Are you excited about Christmas being here? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Man, I love Christmas. There's something homely feeling about Christmas. Um, anybody ever travel home for Christmas? Whether you're growing up or whenever you're older, uh, go to visit family. Anybody visit family for Christmas? Typically, I know things are different this year, but uh, there's something traditional feeling about going home for Christmas. It was one of my favorite things growing up. Um, I grew up in a family in exile. Uh, I was a military kid. Anybody other, else military children? Uh, just traveled all over the place. It was hard to really settle down someplace and have a place that felt like you were home. I was born uh, in Fort Campbell, Kentucky, moved to Clarksville, Tennessee, Corpus Christi, Texas, some other places. But one of the things I always looked forward to was the Christmas season because in the Christmas season, I got to travel back to a place that felt like home. I got to travel back to a place where I could see family, I could see cousins, and uh, I could see grandpa and grandma. And no matter where we lived, we always traveled back for the holidays. And we would travel in style, our family. I'm one of four kids. There's, I've got an older brother, there's me, a younger brother, and then a younger sister, and we're all one year apart. That's right, my mom had four kids four years in a row, which is painful when you're trying to go on long trips. Uh, so what they did was they got themselves a nice van uh, to travel whenever we're traveling home. And so whenever we would travel home for Christmas, we would drive to Flora, Illinois. And depending on where we lived, from Kentucky, it was about a four hour drive. From Corpus Christi, Texas, it was about a whole day drive. So my parents got this really nice van so that we could travel in style, more so that we can have some more space between us on those long trips. But this was one of those vans you might remember. This was like the 80s. So the vans, they didn't care about safety. So the seats in the middle, uh, there's the seats up front, but the seats in the middle, they were the kind where you could twist the seat all the way around. Remember those? And so I could turn to my older brother, we could play games. I could turn to my younger siblings, we could play games. The back seat laid down into a couch. And so we could sleep on the couch while we were driving. There was shades on each of the windows. Uh, we even had a black and white TV on the top of our vehicle, which was amazing. A TV inside of the van. But better than that, my favorite piece of technology in our van was the CB. You think cell phones are cool. Uh, CBs, kids, back in the day, there was a cell phone that you could talk to everybody around you and you didn't need their phone number. You just pushed a button and then you were broadcast to their vehicle, which was great when you're a 10 year old kid. We would turn it to channel 19 because that's where the truckers were. And I heard language that I'd never heard before uh, coming from that CB. And we would talk all the way along that trip, all the way to Flora, Illinois until we finally pulled into corn country. We pulled up to my grandparents' house. We would all jump out of the van and we would go to the door. We wouldn't ring the doorbell because it's Flora. So you just turn the knob and you walk right in. And man, the feelings that would come over me whenever I would walk into that door. Uh, the, the very first thing was just the smells of grandma and grandpa's house. And then I, I would notice the orange carpet of grandma and grandpa's house. And then the cousins running around, bouncing off the walls. I was from a big family, so there was 20, 30 cousins running around, bouncing off the walls. And we would give hugs to everybody and finally see my grandfather, who is my, my hero in life, and give him a humongous hug. There's some comfort in being at a place that wasn't my home, but it was a place that was home. And then I, I loved the way the nights would end. We would all, all of us cousins, we'd, we'd sleep in the living room floor. They, they would just lay blankets down. We'd lay down there, talk throughout the night, trying to get to sleep until finally two, three in the morning, it got quiet. And then we would fall asleep to grandpa's clock, just ticking. And that was home. And I love that comfort of going to a place that was familiar, 
a place that was traditional, a place that was relational. And when coming from a place where I'm moving around everywhere, I felt like I was in exile and then finally getting to a place that felt comfortable. And what I'm excited about this Christmas is this series that we're in called I'll Be Home for Christmas. Because I don't know about you, but right now it feels like we're a people in exile. That we're people who are scattered across the land and it's not just us, but it's the entire world. It feels like we're a church in exile. And I think we've lost what's familiar. I think we've lost what's relational. I think we've lost what's traditional. And my hope, and I know it's going to be different this year, my hope is that Christmas brings a little bit of that back. And so I want to welcome you guys home to Harvester Christian Church this Christmas. This series that we're going to be talking about, we're calling it I'll Be Home for Christmas because we realize two things are, that are going to happen this Christmas season. We realize that there's some of you who are going to be coming back to Harvester Christian Church this, this month as we celebrate Christmas. Um, some of you are to the place where you're like, you know, I think we can come back for the first time. But we also know this, that there's many of you who are home for Christmas this Christmas season. And this is going to be the first Christmas that you haven't spent Christmas in a church building. Like your entire life, you've grown up, you've had candlelight services, you've celebrated Christmas together, you've heard the Christmas carols in person. And for some of you, you feel like you're in exile this Christmas season and that you're far away. And so we want to do this Christmas series where we're able to bring a little bit of Christmas to you, no matter what situation you're in. And so there were, there's two things specifically that we're doing that I want to let you know about. The first one is our Christmas Eve services. We're going to do Christmas Eve services this year, and uh, it's going to happen on Christmas Eve again this year on December the 24th. We've got a service at 2 o'clock, 3.15, 4.30, 6.00, and 11.00. And we're making our six o'clock service masks mandatory because we know that some of you who are watching online, you, you're like, I, I would like to come to Christmas Eve. It's the one service that is really important to me, but I can't because I'm not sure if everybody wears a mask. Six o'clock Christmas Eve, I guarantee you, if you wanna make that a part of your tradition uh, and jump back into that, six o'clock service masks mandatory. The rest of them, we're gonna offer them online as usual. But one of the things we are doing different for everybody is that we are gonna have you register for your Christmas Eve service. And we're gonna have you do that online and you're gonna to get to pick what time you're coming and which venue you wanna watch. If you wanna watch it in the chapel, like we've got some people in the chapel right now, or if you wanna watch it in the Mission Cafe, or if you wanna watch it here in the live auditorium, let us know and that'll allow us to make sure everybody is spaced out, that no room is packed, and that everybody knows where they're going for that Christmas and allow us to welcome some people back home who maybe trying to step in for the very first time. And so registration for that will be opening soon and we're gonna ask everybody to register. But one of the things that's open right now is the ability to register for a Christmas present that Harvester Christian Church wants to give to every household at Harvester, okay? Now, if you're watching at home right now, I especially hope that you will register for one of these. And whether you're watching at home or not, maybe you're on campus, we want everybody to grab one of these. And the way that you can get one of these boxes is in our app, you can just let us know that you want one, we'll register it, and we'll either deliver it to you or you can pick it up from church, whichever is most convenient to you. Now, what I like about this box is this is gonna be the way that we bring Harvester Christian Church to your home and bring a little tradition to your home this Christmas. So for the next four weekends of this series, we're actually gonna open one gift at a time from this box. There's four gifts in this box, one for each of the next four weekends together. And here's what I'm gonna ask you to do to not open it until the weekend comes, okay? You know who I'm looking at, all right? Those of you who go down the Christmas tree, you shake it, you peek in there, you rip the paper. Don't open it until the weekend, okay? So next weekend, we're gonna open the first Christmas gift together, and I hope that you'll do that with us. So make sure you request one of those. The only way to get one is to request one. You can do that on our box. Our hope with all this is to bring a little bit of tradition, to bring a little bit of familiarity, and to bring a little bit of relationship back into our Christmas season. Because I don't know about you, but I feel like we are a people in exile right now. Anybody else feel that way? That, that we, we're holding on to our faith, but it feels like family is just spread out all over the place and we can't be together. But what I love about Christmas and the way Christmas started is that Christmas didn't start in Bethlehem in a manger, but Christmas started hundreds of years before in the nation of Israel when God came to a people and told them that Christmas was coming. And Christmas is actually an invitation to a people in exile. That's where it starts off. 
We read all these prophecies in the Old Testament about this day where this, this child will be born to a virgin and he's coming to this, this world and he's gonna bring all of us together. And those were invitations that were sent out in the past to invite people to a Christmas in the future. And these invitations were sent to the nation of Israel. And I, I love the, the story of Israel. If, if you read the Bible, there's a specific story that we're walked through that, that begins in the book of Genesis and ends in the book of Revelation. But there's a consistent story that happens throughout there. Now, most of us, when we think of the story of the Bible, here's what we think. Adam and Eve sinned. They ate the fruit. Therefore, we're all sinners and Jesus saves us. There's a lot more to the Bible than that, though. And so here, here's a little picture of a, the story of the Bible, and it's a cyclical story that seems to happen over and over in the Bible, where there's a people who are, are called and they're created and they're put into this relationship with God, and it's this, this feeling of family and this feeling of togetherness, where God, he puts a, a call on their lives that you will be my people, I will be your father, we will be a family, and this is our home. Inevitably, what happens in the story, though, is that the people of God abandon God. They turn their back on God. They sin against God. And because of that, they are sent out into exile. They leave the home, and they're scattered across the nations and across the world. And while they're in exile, there's this grief that begins to happen among people where they begin to miss the way things that used to be when they were in a relationship with God. There's this crying out and there's this wailing for God to forgive them of their sins of abandoning him, and then God calls them back home. You look at the story of Adam and Eve. This is the story of Adam and Eve, right? God creates a home for them in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve, they eat the fruit, they sin against God, they abandon their relationship with God, so God boots them out of the garden, and then there's this grief that happens where God begins to say, I've got a plan for you. Even though you abandoned me, I'm gonna send a seed of yours, Eve, who will crush the head of Satan, and you'll be welcomed back into your relationship. This is the story of Israel. Israel is given a promised land, and they're told to, to worship God alone, but once they get to Israel, they abandon God. They worship other gods. And so God boots them out of the promised land and Assyria comes in, Babylon comes in, and they take the, the nation of Israel into exile. And while they're in exile, they begin to grieve and repent. And then God calls them all back home. And I believe this is the story that continues on throughout the history of Israel. But to be honest, it's a little bit of our story as well. But what I love about Israel's story is that prophets show up in the middle of their story to tell them what's going to happen in the future. Now, when you think of a prophet, what do you think of when you think of a prophet? If you're like me, when I hear that someone's a prophet, I typically think of that person who stands outside of Bush Stadium with the bullhorn. That's who I think of of a prophet, where they stand out there, maybe they're on their holier-than-thou soapbox, and they're just yelling at the world. Sinners, which if it's a Cub fan, yes. But the rest of us are like, sinners, you're horrible people. You're going to hell. God hates you. And that's what we think of when we think of a prophet, right? Now, if we're honest, that's a little bit of what the prophets in the Old Testament did. Around the exile and before the exile, they would come into the scene and they would warn Israel of the sins that they had committed. They would stand up in front of the nation and say, you've abandoned God. What are, don't, don't you see what you're doing? That this God who loves you and cares for you, you've left him. You're worshiping other gods. Why have you abandoned God? You're gonna be in so much trouble. God's gonna send other nations in here and he's gonna wipe out our land. This is what prophets are known for. And yes, there were warnings that prophets gave, but what we often forget is what immediately followed the prophet's message. It wasn't just warnings, it was invitations. So yes, the prophets would say, you've abandoned God, but then they would come along and say, you may have abandoned God, but God's not going to abandon you. And so the prophets would come into this story and they would talk about how they've abandoned God, but then they would forecast and talk about what's gonna happen in the future. That even though you may have abandoned God, and even though we might be in exile right now, God's not abandoning us and he's not done with us. And this is where the Christmas prophecies come into play. And this is where we read in the books of like Isaiah and Micah about the, the prophets of Isaiah and Micah saying, you know, you've abandoned God, but God's got a plan to bring you back home. And so when you look at Isaiah, Isaiah chapter seven, verse 14, we read this. 
this invitation back home, this Christmas invitation, where Isaiah says, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. A virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Isaiah chapter nine, verse six, it says, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And Micah, he talks about this city in Bethlehem, this tribe of Bethlehem, um, and he says this, but you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. You see, there wasn't just warnings, there was invitations to a time in the future where God was gonna invite the people back home. And these prophets, they stood on their soapboxes and they began to point towards Christmas season. They pointed ahead to a day when a seemingly far off God would invite us home by coming in the flesh as a baby to rescue people who were scattered in exile. And with this child, he would invite his people back home to a place where they could finally have hope, a hope that they could never find scattered in the world in exile. Essentially, these prophecies were a way for God to look at the nation of Israel and say, Christmas is coming, pack up your bags, get in the van, because we're going home. And church, if I'm being honest, I think we need the same invitation today. This last year um, has, has scattered the church more than I've ever seen it scattered before. I mean, I've seen individuals, I've seen families go into exile and step away from God because the priorities of life have crept in and thus God has been pushed out. But to see it on a mass scale like this has been something different. And I think if there's anything that we need right now as a church, not just Harvester Christian Church, but a church globally, the church needs an invitation back home. And that's why I'm excited about Christmas. I'm excited for the world to remember that when we were apart from God, God made a plan and purposefully stepped into us, into this existence as a child. And I love the way the, the prophets did it. And so if you don't mind, I, I'd like to follow the, the, the way of the prophets and give you some warnings as well as an invitation. Now I realize I am not a prophet, but if I were speaking to the church today, the church global, the church across America, there's two warnings that I would give the church and then two challenges that I would give the church. And the first one is this, the first warning is this, don't get used to distance. That's the challenge I would give to the church in this season. As I look across and I see that the church is kind of distanced away from themselves, I kind of get the impression that the church is a little bit distancing itself from God as well. And so here's a question I would ask you, and I would love for you to answer this question after this, okay? So write this question down. Maybe answer it as a family, answer it in your prayer times, ask yourself and then answer this question. How have you distanced yourself from God this year? How have you distanced yourself from God this year? Has distance crept into your relationship with God? And, and the reality is I think it has. Now, I, I realize that, that some people during this, this pandemic, this COVID season, have really strengthened their faith in God. There's been something about this that has spurred people towards God. But I also think that a majority of people this has really created some confusion in their faith. It's created some distance in their faith. And they're beginning to develop new habits of not being together with God. I mean, think about it. How many of you used to be a part of a church family and you would come here all the time? Naturally, because of the way things have unfolded, our habits have changed and we are moved online. And because of that, we began to develop some new habits, some habits of distance. But that was okay, right? Because we, we gathered our family around, we worshiped with our family, we heard the word with our family, but then what began to happen? The kid wouldn't shut up during the worship songs, like the, the food was being cooked and I had to go take care of something else. Someone would come to the door or we were traveling. And then so we began to say what? Well, we'll just get to it later. They posted on YouTube on Tuesday. So why don't we just, we'll just watch the service on Tuesday and then everybody in our family's watching at different times and then we get out of the habit of being together as a family with Jesus and we've developed some new habits. And these habits have begun to distance us from our King. 
or working from home, we used to be really good about reading our Bible at home. We would get up and we'd have, you know, our chair that we'd sit in. We'd spend some time in prayer. We'd read the scriptures and then we'd go off to work. But now working from home, I got to tell you, that makes it a lot harder on my Bible study time. It makes it a lot harder to pray with God when my six-year-old son is running around shooting me with a Nerf gun. It makes it really hard to spend time with God. So I just say, you know, I'll get to it later. And we've created new habits. And I think these new habits are distancing us from the king of kings. And so now many of us have begun to rely on the kings of this world. Whether that be paychecks or politicians or hobbies or careers, whatever's reigning over us. And we've distanced ourselves from the king of kings. But the thing is, I don't think you have to be a prophet to understand this. I think most of us would agree with this. Things are getting ready to get really difficult for the church, specifically in our country. Things have been difficult for the church historically across time. Things are difficult for the church in many other countries, much more difficult than they are for us. But I think we're beginning to realize that being a Christian is getting ready to to get a lot more difficult in our area, in our country. And so my warning to you is, Don't get used to being distant from the king. Because when things get difficult, you want to be with the king. Don't get used to distance. The second warning I would give is this. Don't get used to digital. Don't get used to digital. Uh, I love the way Isaiah chapter 7 puts it when he's talking about this Christmas season that's coming. And there's two emphasis here that I want to point out. The, The prophet Isaiah, he's looking into the future in this time when Israel scattered looking into the time where they they need to be called back home, and he talks about how they're going to be called back home. And he says, the Lord himself will give you a sign, and this is a sign, this is your invitation to come back home. He says, this is it. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and will call him, say it with me, Emmanuel. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and he will be called Emmanuel. You know what the name Emmanuel means? It means God with us. He says, this is what your invitation back home is going to be. Your invitation home is that God is with us. Now, the question I have is, was God not with them before? Did God somehow completely separate himself from Israel? No, God was still in place. He was still over all things. But he says, God's desire is to be close. And the way he's going to be close is by sending flesh and blood to you. He's going to give birth to a son, and through that son, through that flesh and blood, he's going to be with you. He's going to be able to lay hands on you, to heal you, to pray for you, to hug you, to be there in the flesh. God's saying, don't get used to distance because I'm coming for you, and don't think I'm just coming for you from the cloud. I'm coming up close and personal in the flesh. Now, here's what I know. Digital is incredibly important. Okay, our church, is, we're, we are sold on the vehicle of digital. Like we're gonna do digital services until kingdom comes or until the internet doesn't exist anymore because we realize the value that if you can't be here in person, this is a great option to be together with your family. And so for those of you online, man, welcome to Harvester Christian Church. I hope you feel part of the family here at Harvester. But here's what I hope that you, you realize. I hope that you realize that digital isn't the destination. Digital is just a vehicle to get us to the eventual destination. No matter how many bells and whistles are in the van, the van isn't the point. Being together with the Father is the point. And so church in the cloud is a great tool. And this year, this coming year, 2021, we're gonna make it a better tool. But we believe it's a tool that eventually leads us to Emmanuel, God with us in the flesh. Church in the cloud is great, but the story of Christmas is that God left the cloud and put on flesh and blood, and he came with us in the person. Don't get used to digital, and don't get used to distance. They're they're necessary right now, but eventually a time's coming when God's calling us home. So I want to end with giving you two challenges. This is two challenges that I hope that everybody takes up, and the first challenge is this to renew holy habits while you're in exile. Renew holy habits while you're in exile. So here's the question I would have you ask. How can I draw closer to God today? 
I'm guessing a lot of us have, have experienced that distance. The question I want you to ask is also, how have I distanced from God? But the follow-up question is, what do I need to do to draw closer to God today? What are those habits that I had before all of this that just kind of fell to the background of my life, fell to the background of my day? And what are some things I need to put in place today where I can draw closer to God? We need to renew some holy habits and not just practical habits and quarantine habits. We need to renew some holy habits today. And so here's one of the challenges I would give you. Here's a holy habit to renew. Join together with the body of Christ every single Lord's day. Okay, that is a century old habit of the church, joining together as the body of Christ every Lord's day. Because here's what I realize. Some people have gotten out of the habit of joining together. We've gotten used to distance. We've gotten used to worshiping alone. We've gotten used to being on digital. Like be on digital, be on person, but make it consistent. Be here every single week. And when I say be here, I mean, I mean be here live. And not just, you know, I'll get to it when the kids are in bed on Wednesday night, okay? That's great for informational purpose, but if you wanna gather together as a family, make it a habit of yours to join together every Lord's Day. And this is the challenge I would give you. Be with us every weekend of this Christmas series. Now, I say that, and I'm, I want you to hear me say this. If you're sick, don't be here, like be at home, but use digital. It's a great platform. It's a great plan B when you can't be here, okay? So if you're at risk, be at home. Don't be here, but be with us. Be with God every Lord's Day together. The second challenge I would give you is this. Have a conversation about coming home. And this is a challenge that I wanna give to those of you who are specifically online today. Have a conversation about coming home. I know most of us, we realize that it's not possible for those of you online, it's just not possible to be together. And I want you to know, we recognize that. And the reason we're doing this Christmas series is to hopefully bring some Christmas to you while you're at home. But the conversation that I hope you're having is, you know, when is the time that we can be back together with our family, our church family? When's the time where we can leave the exile of worshiping alone and not in community and being together in community. What's the marker for you? That, that, that when that marker comes, it's time to rejoin with the family. And, and be practical about it. Is, it. is it when the COVID numbers go down? Is it when there's a vaccine? And I'm hoping there's some kind of marker that you're like, that's the marker, that's the sign, that's the, the birth of the child that shows us that God is inviting us back home. And then my prayer is that you will take that invitation and come back home. For now, I know that's not possible for some of you. So I want you to know that we're praying for you and we pray that this Christmas season, as we talk about being home for Christmas, that it brings some joy to you. But here's what I realized. Every single one of us, at some level, need to accept Jesus' invitation back home. How have you distanced? And then hear the doorbell ring and hear God inviting you back home. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you so much for your love. I thank you for really the miracle of the church. God, I know it would have been easy to just die on a cross and then save us individually. And God, I know that some, that's how some people are living their faith out. That it's just a you and me thing. But God, the miracle of the church is that you died on a cross and that you called the church your bride that you called us together and you gave us gifts and you gave us spiritual gifts and abilities and talents to take care of each other and to, to be in community and to put aside all exterior labels so that we can become one body of Christ. And God, I pray over your church this Christmas season because I know right now it's not possible for us all to be back together and to be in that community. And so God, my prayer is that you end this exile that you rid this world of this disease and that you heal us of our pains and heal us of our hurts, that you rid us of our habits and you point our eyes back to Christ. And that as we walk towards him, we walk together as a people, accepting your invitation to be back in a relationship with you closer. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen.